The first S-Type Jaguar appeared in 1964 and continued through to 1968 when the XJ6 was launched. It was essentially the front end of the classic Mark II Jag saloon, with a new elongated boot and the independent rear suspension from the E-Type bolted on in place of the Mark II's evil live rear axle and half elliptic springs. Although in many ways a better handling and more sophisticated car than the Mark II, it never really achieved the same cult status as a 3.8 Mark II, still one of the most popular classic cars around. In fact, the S-Type had a good reputation as a getaway car. The independent rear end gave much better grip and stability than the Mark II, and an S-Type featured prominently in the film Robbery, where the car chase laid the foundations for the subsequent car chase in Bullet. And whenever an S-Type appeared in television series like The Professionals, driven by the bad guys, you just knew it was going to be wrecked or rammed by Brody and Doyle's Granada. The launch of the XJ6 marked the end of Jaguar's sports saloons, and the company hasn't ventured back into that territory until now with the launch of the new S-Types. Cynics might say it's not a proper Jaguar. Ford ownership of the company has resulted in the use of a modified Lincoln floor pan and drivetrain. However, it's very Jaguar inside, and the exterior styling certainly harks back to the styling cues of the 1960s although the finished result is very close to the new Rover 75. The S-Type enters a fiercely competitive market and one that's been traditionally very lucrative in the UK, at least for motor manufacturers. However, with the realisation slowly sinking into the buying public consciousness that we really do pay over the odds for our cars, especially in this class, it might not be quite such a profitable sector in the future. There's no doubt that it will be a very important new car for the company. Jaguar say it will double their sales by next year, with 40% of the S-Types going to the States. Jaguar also say it's their first V6. The car comes with a 3-litre V6 or a 4-litre V8. As English as, as English as, Mrs. Beaton. Was she English? Dunno. As English as, a summer's day in the country. Yeah, if you like caravans and drizzle. But it's not actually English anymore. Then again, we can't claim a world dominance of cricket anymore either. So let's ignore the nationalistic bit and simply say it has a fine pedigree. Because this is the new Jaguar S-Type, and with a shape that instantly recalls the Mark II of the 1960s. But don't think tartan rug and golf clubs, think caddish grins, cops and robber chases, and hello. Of course, it was easier for Jaguar back then. They just built a better, faster and prettier car than everyone else on the market. It's slightly more difficult now, though, thanks to some serious competition for the title. Back to the present, the new S-Type is pitched against this, the BMW 5 Series. No one at Jaguar tries to make any secret of it, we'd laugh at them if they did, because we all know that it's true. The BMW is the benchmark in the class. Sleek, smart, ruthlessly efficient, it never puts a foot wrong. When faced with such clinical and cold opposition, what can our Tweedy friend do? Well, for a start, it ain't Tweedy. Jaguar messed around with a lot of designs before they plumped for this one. And it's full of references to Jags of the past, particularly the old Mark IIs of the 60s. If you look at the grille shape and the headlamps, the whole of the snout, in fact, it's all very dramatic stuff, particularly with this upcurving line running the length of the profile of the car, all of which makes it all the more surprising. When we open it up, take a look inside, and, oh, well, there's absolutely no sense of occasion to match the drama of the exterior of the car. There's no outstanding feature. It's Euro blandness. There's nothing wrong with the interior, I'm sure, and I don't doubt the quality of it, but, well, it just does nothing. There's a choice of two engines available to us, a familiar 4-litre V8 lump already found in the XJ8 and XK8, and for the first time in a Jaguar, a V6. Now it's actually Ford's Duratec V6, which might not sound very glamorous, but it's very good news, because it's an excellent engine. Three litres, more than enough for this car, and it'll probably be the most popular choice. Once you're on the move, despite the size of the car, and despite its very comfortable Jaguar ride, it's very well controlled, behaves itself very well through the bends, and is a genuine sporting drive. 
That's not to say it's uncomfortable in here, far from it. It's got the usual silky smooth Jaguar ride and probably every gizmo you could think of to keep you comfy and occupied. And probably one or two you wouldn't think of, including Trevor McDonald lodged in the glove box. Really, watch this. Climate control, temperature 24 degrees. Trevor. Climate control, huh? temperature huh? 24.0 degrees. Thank you very much, Trevor. Actually, quite a lot of the stuff in here is voice activated, including the climate control, the CD player, even the telephone you can dial up with just your voice, which really, really impresses your friends. The English have a reputation for demonstrating little eccentricities. No one bats an eyelid at the sight of an Englishman leaving his castle dressed in a tutu, wellies and a plastic tam shanter for the annual haggis hunt. They know we do it, they know we're all mad. They know entire English villages wake up on festival days to smear themselves in badger droppings and race naked through the streets on converted beds. But we do it all with a sense of style and we do it all on purpose, and that's what makes it eccentric, rather than behaviour that leads straight to the comfy room with a jacket that does up at the back. But to get really nutty, you need to be landed gentry, and that's why Jaguar have for years been able to build a car that's bigger on the outside than a cricket pitch, and smaller on the inside than a cricket box. Jaguar are posh, still fact. Now let's see Hyundai try that. Jaguar hope to sell 50,000 S-Types a year, which will have some bearing on the car's status. It certainly won't be a rarity. And that, coupled to the affordable prices, means that any exclusivity is going to be hard-earned on the part of the baby Jag. Starting from 28,300 for the V6 manual and rising to 37,610 pounds for the V8, it's certainly competitively priced. There's no doubt that when the folks at Jaguar readied the S-Type for production, they decided to err on the side of caution, probably for fear that any quirks on the part of the car would be misinterpreted as a failing. But it does mean that the result is, well, frankly, a little bit frigid. It lacks a certain amiable warmth and cosiness that I'd like to have found there. The automotive equivalent, say, of leather elbow patches on a 700 quid smoking jacket, which is a shame. When I reviewed the BMW 5 Series for this program, my only criticism, if it is a criticism, was that the car is almost too good at everything that it does. That the S-Type is very nearly as good, but still retains a little bit of the old hello, can only be in its favour. Sure, the 5 Series will never put a foot wrong, but you can bet your life, if the S-Type ever did, it would come up with a damn fine excuse. <laughs> It's the most amazing revival since Tony Blair and the Labour Party got back into power. I'm talking about the return from the brink of extinction of Jaguar, that great British car name. And this is the very latest evidence of the return to glory days of E-Class, Inspector Morse's Mark II. This is a sensational S-Type. It's the hottest property in the motoring world today. I'm the lucky holder of the keys to this car and I am looking forward to this drive like I haven't looked forward to a drive for a long time. This is the car that is putting the fear of the God up the German luxury car mark at the moment and you can understand why. You just got to look at it from the outside and you get inside it's pure class. This car if it drives as well as it looks is going to be a monstrous winner. I'm driving the new Jaguar 3 litre engine because it's the first V6 Jaguar ever produced and it's got the manual gearbox. Manuals were not a strong Jaguar point in the past. The other engine is the superb 4 litre V8 that's already got wide acclaim in the XK8 and the XJ. That in this car makes it a tremendously smooth motor. But I have to say that for me the automatic is still the best Jaguar to have. The manual gearbox will appeal to the sporty drivers who like the involvement of changing gear a lot, but for me, Jaguar, with this engine as well, automatic would be the one for me. Start and put the Jag through its paces, get it on some twisty winding roads, 
and push it hard and the handling does everything you'd expect. It really does hug the road well. It copes well with any type of sort of deviation in the road surface. This is a Jag that can be hustled. Pricing's also pretty competitive. You get a starting price with the three liter at 28.6 and you go up to a top of the range 37.600 for the four liter SE. The big thing about the S-Type is that it's going to lead an all-new generation of Jaguar cars, which is going to see Jaguar triple its production from 50,000 to over 300,000 in the year 2002-2003, which is unbelievable a few years ago. And that's going to mean one thing, serious problems for the German boys. BMW, Audi, Mercedes, they're all going to lose sales to Jaguar. Dave Schupak, as project director of the S-Type, who is uh, the new S-Type going to appeal to? We expect the new S-Type will appeal to uh, a very wide-ranging uh, number of customers, different customers to our current range of cars, a younger customer, uh, very much executive families and uh, um, people that today buy the 5 Series and the Mercedes E-Class, and also, we hope, to, to many more women buyers as well. So why will the new S-Type appeal to buyers of Mercedes, BMW or Audi? The whole mission for the Jaguar S-Type is really to be a very distinctive style of car, instantly recognisable and give someone the choice of that very stylish car and also have that Jaguar ride and handling feel to really enjoy uh, driving the car and the performance that goes with that. Think Jaguar and you instantly think style. When it comes to blending wood and leather, nobody can quite match us Brits. They've all tried, but when it comes to a touch of class, Jaguar are showing the rest of the way. Executive cars demand real comfort and the Jaguar is a winner in the comfort stakes. Seats are very comfortable, very good long distance cruisers. So, my verdict on the Jaguar S-Type? Well, the boys from Jaguar have done it again. This is the type of Jag that gives you that feel-good-to-be-British factor. I suggest that Jaguar are going back into the big time, just like the glory days of the Mark II. And they're going to have one thing in common, they're both going to be huge successes. Oh, just another thought as well for the people at BMW and Rover. Here's a perfect example that proves you can bring a great British car name back from the dead. Take a look, boys. It should give you hope. After the break, the car file opens on the desirable and powerful BMW M Coupe and M Roadster. B, M and W. Three letters that sum up the quality and performance you get from the pride of Bavaria. But of course, if it's real driving excitement you're after, then you'll be looking for an extra letter on the back of your BMW. It is, of course, the letter M, telling you that this BMW has come from the company's motorsport division. Now, it no longer just looks after their racing interests, but in recent years has found a new hobby, tweaking and tuning your average BM and turning them into supercars. <laughs> First off the block for the ultimate makeovers was the M3, hot on its heels the M5, one of the most extreme sports saloons ever. The third generation M5 at next summer promises absolutely blistering performance, with its 5 litre V8 developing an incredible 400 brake horsepower and catapulting the 5 from 0 to 60 in 5.1 seconds. But as I said, that's next summer. Let's get back to the here and the now, because these are the keys to a rather special BMW that carries the letter M. Now, from certain angles, you may well think you've seen this car before. The flare of the wheel arches, the swell of the bonnet, could lead you to believe that this is the M Roadster. But on closer inspection, you realise that this is in fact a very different beast. This is the M Coupe. The car to silence any of the critics who claim that the Roadster just wasn't butch enough. The M Coupe is packed with more testosterone than you'd get on a night out with the Chippendales. And personally, I think its curves and bulges are far sexier than anything those lads have to offer. This is the kind of car you can't ignore.
Now you may not be able to ignore it, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you'll like it. But what you will do is have an opinion about it. It looks to me as though it's just escaped from a cartoon. The low-down, laid-back, hot rod looks are pure Looney Tunes on acid. And yep, I reckon that BMW's design guru Chris Bangle had a fantastic time when he put pen to paper and came up with this one. And while they may have very different bodies, the interior is definitely that from the Roadster. Gorgeous two-tone upholstery that comes in some fantastic colours. Glorious curves that reflect onto the passenger side. And of course, all the chrome and those little red needles that promise you hours of fun. Now in the coupe there is of course plenty more room in the back for all your bags than you'd find in the Roadster but rather unsurprisingly the space inside the cabin is exactly the same. It's not fantastic but I don't have a problem with it. What I do have a problem with is the fact that the steering wheel isn't adjustable. Now you're paying £41,000 for this car, I will find that very annoying. It's one of those things that when you live with it could become a huge irritation. But I still think it's gorgeous, and we haven't even got round to talking about the little letter M yet. And this is what you're paying the best part of 41 grand for. The tinkering and tweaking from the boys in the motorsport division have transformed this car into a chariot of the gods. So let's talk for a minute about this 3.2 litre straight six that peaks at around seven and a half thousand revs. Now there's 321 brake horsepower packed in here that will get you from 0 to 60 in 4.9 seconds without even having to change up into third. There really is a seemingly never ending thrust of power coming from this engine that sounds absolutely incredible and just seems to go on and on until you reach 155 miles per hour and the limiter kicks in and spoils all the fun. To keep up with old Looney Tunes, you'd better be behind the wheel of, at the very least, a 911. Behind the wheel, it smiles all round. The stiffness of the chassis brings such amazing levels of control that it's impossible not to be very impressed. Now, if you're a real driving fanatic, you might long for BMW's wonderful sequential manual gearbox in here to play around with. But I'm sorry to have to tell you that it just won't fit. You're going to have to make do instead with an excellent five-speed manual, which is, I promise you, it's still loads of fun. Now, I suppose the question about the M Coupe is, does the price tag justify the driving experience? I reckon, yes, it does. It really is a fantastic car. And for me, the icing on the cake is its unusual looks. It does draw gasps, stares, waves everywhere that it goes. I just love it. In fact, I can only think of one downside to owning the M Coupe the rather large amounts of money you'd spend on hiring out a test track, just so you can get the most out of the feeling you get when your foot hits that pedal. Now, if you're a regular viewer to Men & Motors, as I certainly hope you are, you've probably noticed over the past year or so that one of our favourite cars has been BMW's Z3. We've driven it in 1.9 and 2.8 versions. We've been to the factory in South Carolina to see it being made. So before you start thinking, oh no, not another Z3, well, this is a special one. This is BMW's M Roadster, a Z3 that's been given the M treatment. You can see immediately that this is no ordinary Z3. Enormous wheels and tyres, particularly flared wheel arches at the rear. There's a very low front spoiler and these gorgeous chrome trims either side. Plus, mirrors and dials exclusive to the M Roadster. So you get exclusive extras on the M Roadster, as you should do on a car costing as much as this. More about that 
a little later though. Inside you get some rather unusual colouring designs on the seats which also run through to the fascia, all rather functional rather than particularly attractive. You get air conditioning, heated seats and a power hood which works exactly as it should do very well. But the real difference you notice in this car is when you start the beast up. Now our test car is almost brand new, it's only done what 2,000 miles or so and perhaps that's the reason why the gearbox on this particular car is so notchy. It needs a few more miles under its belt to really smooth that and in fact engaging reverse gear really can be a bit of a problem at times. The engine in this M Roadster is the 3.2 litre straight six taken from the M3. It produces 321 brake horsepower through those enormous rear tyres and with no traction control this is a car to be taken very seriously and treated with respect, if not a little bit of caution at times. Official performance figures for this car indicate an 0 to 60 time of 5.1 seconds and a top speed limited to 155 miles per hour. And I found that to really appreciate just how fast this car is, you really have to drive it very hard. So, what do we like, what don't we like about the M Roadster? Well, the brakes are absolutely excellent. They stop you dead when you need to stop. The suspension and ride is very good, if not a little hard, but it is a sports car after all. If you're over six feet tall, you'll feel a bit cramped in the cabin. The seat won't go further back than I'm sat here in it, and that could be a bit of a problem for some people. Also, there's no adjustable steering wheel, and if anything, the steering wheel could do with being a touch smaller. 